Carol was diagnosed with dementia at the Mayo Clinic uh, three and a half years ago. She was in intensive care and had seizures and all that. And Dr. Solomon says, you're the only couple I've walked into the intensive care and I'm in bed with her, <laughs> you know, holding her hand on the same single bed together. She couldn't get over that. The thing that got me about Dr. Solomon was the recommendations that she made she had all these contacts already set up. She pointed us towards uh, an audiologist uh, because hearing is so important uh, in dealing with memory issues. And she pointed us towards a, a memory support group. She is so pleasant and, and yet gets down to the, the knit and gritty. And I don't mind opening up to her. She's just pleasant. So marketing to older adults in the brain is a billion dollar industry. They are right now the hot target for marketers, the baby boomers. Um, in 2013, AARP did a study showing that over three quarters of older adults said that they care more about brain health than they do things like social security reform, uh, physical health. But when they asked them where they were getting their information from, they all said the media. We are so afraid of dementia as a culture. I think part of that is we're so focused on our accomplishments, what we do for work, things that we accumulate, that when we start to lose those things, that's how identities can get lost throughout the process of dementia, is that people stop being able to tell you what it is they did for a living. They start to lose knowledge of what it is that they did their whole life. Um, but my thought is that that's just an aspect of personhood. It's not the whole story. My grandmother's name was Jean Allen Nicholl, and she came from Scotland when she was in her 20s. She came here and worked as an accountant for Otis Elevator, so a professional at a time when women didn't necessarily do that. Every time I went to her house, we would share a Macintosh apple in the backyard. We weren't quite sure what was going on with her at first. She would call the house and accuse us of having been there previously. And she became more and more forgetful, had more trouble finding her words, was more confused, um, was more agitated. And when I was about 15 years old, she was then diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And she just required more and more care over time. And so um, I decided to quit school. As I began to understand what she was going through more, I realized that there were a lot of people in her retirement community that were also going through this. So I went to our local mall and put up a series of three by three index cards that said, caregiver available for hire. <laughs> and um, that's basically what I did for the next few years of my life. I could just go through dozens of names of people, you know, Ed, Libra, Eloise, Laura, Josephine, Stephanie, Bill. I became part of their family and they really became part of me in my journey going forward. A movie named Awakenings came out, which was based on the 1973 memoir of Dr. Oliver Sacks, who's a British neurologist, who told the story of a group of inpatients in New York um, that had been asleep for over 20 years due to an outbreak of encephalitis. And he had the idea to give them a medication called L-Dopa, which basically woke them up. I saw it five times. I sat in the back row every single time I saw it so people wouldn't hear me sob. <laughs> but it wasn't tears of sadness. I was just so profoundly moved that you could help people in such a a different way than I had known and that you could be that kind of a doctor. And I realized that's exactly the kind of doctor that I wanted to be. 
So I think that my background of being in homes with people, really understanding aging on a personal level, but also having this really wonderful, high-level academic education, combining those two things is basically me. How are you? Are you here for the lecture? Yes, thank you so much. I had seen so many patients come in telling me about these really expensive, no scientific basis interventions that they were doing. It really bothered me that they were spending so much money on these things because there is this whole world of scientific knowledge that's out there that just isn't well communicated to the general public. And that's really what I wanted to try to do with CARE, was just simply to bring that information to older adults to help them make more informed decisions about their brain. What is the CARE for Your Brain program? So what we tried to do with this series is design nine lectures that really meet the needs that I think older adults have for this craving of information about the brain. You know, our responsibility is to love folks sometimes in their most uh, vulnerable situations. And that's when folks need to be nurtured and loved more than ever. What can we do to provide a better quality of life for the people who live here, the people who work there, and those who love the people who live and work there? And so our investment in the CARE program gives us an opportunity to do that research and understand the outcomes. And then when you also have someone as dynamic as Dr. Sullivan, it's an easy investment to make. But older adults want this information, it's just that they don't have a reliable, trustworthy source to get it. So many of the recommendations that come out of the CARE program, really all of the recommendations, are completely free. They're things that people can do on their own, independently, with the help of their community. There's no need to go buy supplements, there's no reason to play expensive computer games. There's so many different things we can do for brain health that really are within people's everyday experience. I think it's just a matter of connecting them and the people that take care of them to that information. So I was delighted when I heard that Pinnock was going to partner with Karen. I think it would be very beneficial to have this type of enrichment experience in their lives. It's very easy to engage with her and understand and appreciate what she says. And as somebody said once, she never said one um. <laughs> my first thought is what would they all think of me because it's, um, it started with my grandmother but really there's so many people that I carry with me. I think that they would all be really proud <laughs> of me and um, think that I had done the right thing by taking their painful experiences in some instances and making something really good out of it and trying to have a positive change in the world. You know, the awareness of what she is doing is spreading. Arrival here has been a blessing. Um, she's helped so many people already. And she has a mission. This gal has a mission.